hello to everyone and thank you to PacBio for the opportunity to present our work. I'm Pablo Carbonell. I'm a postdoc in Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology in the laboratory of Tetlef Weigel. And we are interested in studying the genetic origin for diversity in grapevine agronomic traits. For instance, variation in fruit color have been selected for the production of different types of wine. Diversity in fruit shape and size has also been selected because this is interesting for the table grapes market. In more recent breeding programs, a resistance to pathogens uh, has been introduced from wild relatives to domesticated cultivars. And once cultivars with interesting traits are selected, they have to be vegetatively propagated to keep the varietal attributes because the genome of grape and cultivars is highly heterozygous. So in that manner, the origin of most grape and cultivars is a sexual cross between another two cultivars and then from the ancestral seedling, the cultivar attributes are vegetatively propagated to the vast extension of vineyards where they are cultivated today, a process that often prolongs even for centuries. However, during this uh, vegetative propagation, somatic mutations accumulate and sometimes uh, they can lead to novel interesting phenotypes so that they are the base uh, of clonal selection for cultivar improvement. And indeed, somatic variation is something that we want to study. And for instance, in Tempranillo cultivar, that is a red wine cultivar, the most relevant in Spain and the third most cultivated in the world. In previous projects, we have selected somatic variants uh, with interesting ripening features that are adaptable to quality wine production under climate change conditions. And also we have selected other somatic variants uh, like variants in fluid color and to identify the genetic origin of this somatic variation. We have produced a genome assembly and PacBio isoseq data for this cultivar. And also in another project in collaboration with Julius Kuhn Institute, we are studying a regen cultivar that is a, also a red wine cultivar, but of a more recent origin. It was uh, produced in a breeding program for the integration of pathogen resistance alleles into uh, domesticated uh, genetic background. And we have also produced PacBio isoseq and genome assembly for this cultivar and a direct aim is uh, the uh, identification of genetic variation responsible of uh, QTLs uh, for resistance to powdery mildew that have been already mapped in this cultivar. And then uh, because uh, grape and cultivars are highly heterozygous, we want to produce haplotype result genome assemblies in these two cultivars, we can take advantage that their pedigree is uh, known. And for instance, in the case of Tempranillo, although the sexual cross took place uh, several centuries ago, uh, much more recent genetic analysis have identified uh, this uh, pedigree of the cultivar. And in, in the case of Regen, that it was produced in a breeding program about 60 years ago, there's a record for the pedigree. And we can use this pedigree information for haplotype uh, result genome assembly. And in this case, uh, we use the Canutrio binning pipeline and we sequence uh, with uh, short reads the parents of each of the two cultivars. And then we perform uh, K-mer analysis to identify from the short reads k specific from one or the other parent. And then we sequence our target cultivars with uh, long reads, in this case with PacBioSilla reads. And then according to the presence of specific k from one or the other parent, the long reads are classified in each of the two haplotypes and that are assembled in separate for each of the two cultivars. And as input data, as I told, uh, we use uh, PacBio CLR, and in this case we use CLR because uh, we started the project in Tempranillo about two years ago when hi-fi um, sequencing from PacBio was still not available. And in our sequencing, we can see uh, the progress of PacBio technology because uh, uh, in the Tempranillo assembly, we needed uh, five uh, SQL1 smart cells to get uh, a bit more than 100x coverage of the genome. While in Regent, uh, we already use uh, SQL2 and a single run uh, was enough to reach uh, almost four times more coverage. And we can also see the progress in the PAC biochemistry in terms of the read length that we get that was uh, from similar high quality libraries, close to 32 KB in Tempranillo and more than 38 KB or uh, read and 50 for Regent. And then from this uh, input data, the results of our assemblies are very good because in each of the two cultivars, we can fully assemble uh, the maternal and the paternal inherited haplotypes. And so in all cases, we reach uh, assembly sizes 
of uh, around 480 megabases, which is the estimated size for the grapevine uh, genome. And indeed, uh, BUSCO analysis also shows that our haplotype uh, assemblies are complete because in all cases we reach a completeness values above 96% and 96% is the completeness that is estimated in the same uh, way for the grapevine reference. And in terms of uh, contiguity, our results are also very good, especially in the case of Regen, where we reach contig and 50 values of uh, around 12 megabases, which is half of the size of uh, grapevine chromosomes which indicates that uh, from a single uh, technology that we are using, only by using PacBio, we are able to assemble uh, chromosome arm uh, level assemblies. And in the case of Tempranillo, starting from uh, lower coverage, contiguity is a bit lower, but still quite good. And then taking advantage uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, there's a reference genome available for grapevine, we also did uh, reference-based scaffolding and in all cases we achieve the, the expected number of 19 chromosomes and then also to evaluate the quality we have also performed a phasing analysis using mercury tool and also using the information of gamers from the short reads of the parents and here we can see represented the result for for the reagent uh, assembly for the two haplophases what we have here is the size of blocks of the same phase that cover uh, a specific proportion of the assembly for each of the two haplophases. And what we can see is that uh, most of the assembly uh, is covered by blocks of the, of the expected haplotype. And indeed the block M50 that we get is uh, around 20 megabases, which is uh, uh, almost uh, the size of chromosomes. Uh, and only a few small blocks on each of the haplophases uh, involve uh, haplotype switches which indicates that we have almost perfectly phased uh, assemblies, but then we're going to use these assemblies for functional studies. And to do so, we are also annotated genes in the assemblies and we are using uh, PacBio isosec to get uh, accurate uh, full length uh, transcript sequence for the annotation. And in the case of uh, Tempranillo, we have sequence uh, from RNA of uh, 15 different uh, tissues in one and a half uh, smart cell and in the case of Regent uh, we sequence uh, from with isoseq uh, nine uh, tissues in a single SQL2 smart cell and in this case we also included the samples uh, infected with powdery mildew to study candidate genes uh, for resistance to this pathogen and in another project that I will also uh, describe at the end of the talk uh, we are also uh, producing isoseq uh, for uh, type of grape uh, samples uh, to study uh, the genetic origin of uh, variation in fruit shape. Uh, for the isoseq, uh, we follow the protocol described by PacBio, which uh, involves a uh, high fidelity sequencing uh, of uh, amplified uh, cDNA. And then for the analysis to identify isoforms uh, and genes, uh, we follow the isoseq 3 pipeline also developed by PacBio. And then in all three uh, isoseq uh, SQL2 runs that we've done, the results are very reproducible. In all cases, we have almost a full house, uh, 8 million wells in the smart cell uh, working with uh, always uh, around uh, 7 million of reads produced. And then after CCS calling for quality 20 and, uh, and sample demultiplexing, we recover uh, about uh, half of the reads and sometimes uh, even more for downstream analysis. And then after the analysis, uh, we identify a wide uh, distribution of uh, isoform lengths. So in, in all cases, the distribution is um, between uh, 50 or 80 base pairs to more than 12 uh, KB and very reproducible, for instance, between the two cultivars that we are analyzing with uh, a isoform average length of uh, about uh, or 2.5 KB. And then, so we want to use the isoseq data to annotate our assemblies and what we do is uh, with uh, the isoseq 3 pipeline collapsing uh, the isoforms into our de novo assemblies and when we collapse uh, the isoseq data to each of the uh, haplophases uh, for the same cultivar that the isoseq uh, has been uh, produced, we always identify mm, around 1000 genes uh, more in the specific assemblies than when we uh, collapse the isoseq data to the reference uh, genome 
And indeed, when we collapse uh, the ICC crits uh, for a um, version of the assembly of the same cultivar and uh, that uh, harbors the two haplot phases together, we identify almost uh, double number of genes, which indicates that in most cases, we are able to identify uh, the two alleles uh, for most of the genes. Um, however, the number of genes that we identify is always uh, a bit higher in Tempranillo than in uh, Regent. And uh, to check if uh, in Regent uh, our isosync sequencing depth uh, was already uh, enough to identify all the genes present or uh, expressed in the sample, we also perform uh, saturation curves analysis by read subsampling. And what we can see is that uh, in the two cultivars uh, in our isoseq, uh, we are already uh, saturating both the number of uh, genes and isoforms that can be uh, detected, which indicates that the higher number of uh, transcripts or of genes uh, uh, identified in Tempranillo is uh, related uh, with uh, higher transcriptome complexity in the 15 tissues that were analyzed by isoseq as compared to nine tissues analyzed in Regent. And then to detect uh, novel uh, genes and novel isoforms, we also run uh, the SCANT3 pipeline that uh, compares uh, the isoforms in the isoseq to annotations in, in a reference genome, in this case in the uh, grape reference. And we also run SCANT3 filter uh, to remove possible isoseq artifacts uh, due to uh, intrapolyate priming or uh, retrotranscriptase uh, switches. And even after removing uh, artifacts, we, we identify between 17 and 19,000 genes that are annotated in, in the reference. But in addition, uh, we identify uh, close to 900 novel genes uh, from the ISOSIC of region and more than 1,500 novel genes uh, from the ISOSIC of Tempranillo. Uh, these novel genes involve a sequence that is uh, present in the reference genome but that was not annotated before as coding sequence. And now the ISOSIC identified that this is indeed a transcribed uh, region. And then uh, with scan 3 we can also classify our isoforms based on uh, space uh, junction sites comparing to the reference annotations. And by doing so, so we see that uh, most of the isoforms in the ISOSIC in the two cultivars are full splice match, which uh, indicates that they have the same transcript structure and in the, as in the reference annotations, but we also identify a large proportion of uh, novel isoforms. The most abundant is novel noting catalog, which involves uh, the presence of exons in the ISOSIC data uh, with splice junctions that uh, were not annotated in the, in the reference genome. And we also identify other types of uh, novel isoforms, uh, including uh, fusion genes and also a fraction of uh, novel genes uh, in intergenic regions and also novel genes uh, in the antisense strand of uh, already annotated genes. But then we also want to uh, use uh, ISOSIC for functional studies. And as a proof of concept, here I'm showing uh, uh, the mappings of uh, uh, ISOSIC of Tempranillo uh, to the two haplotypes in the de novo assembly of Tempranillo for the fruit color locus. And in this case, Tempranillo is heterozygous for this locus so that it presents a functional copy and a non-functional copy of the uh, transcription factors that are um, responsible for the synthesis of anthocyanins and of color production. And what we see is that in the non-functional copy of the assembly, we see no read mapping in agreement with the presence of a retrotransposon insertion in regulatory regions of this gene inhibiting the expression of the gene. In contrast, we see reads mapping in the, to the functional allele of the assembly, but uh, they, they mostly map uh, in free skin tissue and almost no mapping to, to free flesh and no reads at all in roots and leaves, uh, which uh, is in agreement uh, with the specific expression of uh, this gene in, in free skin. Also from uh, these uh, read mappings, we can see that they are here in uh, gray color, which means the uh, same sequence in the isoseq and in the assemblies, which indicates for accuracy uh, in both cases. Only a single uh, isoseq read here shows some indels and is maybe of lower quality. But in general, uh, we can tell uh, from, from this analysis that the combination of isoseq and de novo assemblies is useful to detect uh, haplotype specific expression and also to detect 
uh, variation of expression between different tissues. And then we also want to use uh, isoseq for specific functional studies and in the case of uh, regen cultivar uh, for the characterization of uh, candidate genes for powdery mildew uh, resistance and in this case uh, for QTL that have been identified, and uh, regent is also heterozygous, harboring a uh, resistance uh, allele and a susceptible allele. And uh, here I'm showing um, grids mapping to, to the diploid uh, assembly of uh, regent uh, from RNA-seq and ISO-seq data from regent in a candidate gene that was uh, identified uh, as being uh, overexpressed in individuals uh, carrying the, the resistance uh, allele. And uh, so what we can see from these uh, mappings is that uh, the RNA-seq already identifies some overexpression of the uh, resistance allele over the susceptible allele, but the situation is much more clear when we have isoseq data because uh, what we see that is happening is, is that in the susceptible haplotype there's uh, no expression at all, while uh, there's expression in the, in the resistant haplotype and indeed, as in the iso data, we have also strand information. We can tell from this data that uh, in this locus, uh, there are two genes that are expressed, one in the uh, plus strand here represented uh, by red uh, transcripts, and another uh, gene in the minus um, strand represented by blue transcripts. And in addition, this, uh, this gene in the minus strand uh, involves the expression of different isoforms uh, that overlap uh, with the gene in the plus strand and also uh, partial isoforms and all in this uh, variation is in agreement uh, with structural variation that we see in the assembly with the, between the two haplotypes and altogether support that uh, this uh, gene is the responsible for the resistance to powdery mildew in regent. Also in another project, uh, the last uh, uh, results that I'm presenting today, uh, we are using isoseq uh, to characterize uh, candidate genes uh, for variation in uh, fruit shape in table grapes. And in this case, although we don't have um, a specific genome assembly for these uh, cultivars, uh, we thought that isoseq could be useful uh, to resolve the case. Uh, in this case, um, in a cross population between uh, two uh, table grade cultivars uh, that uh, segregate for variation in fruit shape, in a previous transcriptome analysis, we identify a candidate gene colocalizing with the QTL that is overexpressed in individuals showing large elliptical berries as compared to no expression in individuals uh, with small uh, spherical uh, fruits and intermediate expression in the, in the parents that are uh, of the progeny that are heterozygous for the QTL. However, this uh, overexpressed candidate gene uh, was difficult to, to, to study. It is a histone replace factor. However, it belongs to a small uh, gene family that is uh, duplicated in tandem uh, within the QTL region and we identified uh, three gene copies in the QTL region. And, and we thought that isoseq could be useful to identify which is the gene copy that is overexpressed and which is the allele that is overexpressed. So that uh, uh, we map uh, isoseq reads to, to the reference genome in this case. And here I'm showing uh, results uh, of mapping of, um, of uh, the isoseq uh, reads from one of the parents of the progeny that is heterozygous for the presence of uh, an allele for the production or the development of uh, elliptical fruits. And we can see that in the first copy of the gene, there's no expression from the isoseq uh, mappings. In the third copy of the gene, there's only uh, a little expression. And the isoseq data indicates that is the second copy of the gene, the one that is overexpressed. And when we analyze in more detail to the isoseq reads mapping uh, into this uh, second copy of the gene, we can see also that the situation is uh, more complex than expected because in the reference uh, this, uh, in this locus, uh, there are indeed two consecutive genes uh, annotated in the minus uh, strand of, of, the, of the reference. But we see from the ISOSIC data that indeed, yeah, there are a few transcripts that uh, support the expression of uh, two genes from uh, this uh, locus, but uh, most of the transcripts support uh, uh, the expression of a single gene that covers the, the whole region. And indeed also from the isoseq data, we can identify a SNP in the last exon of the gene. And uh, from the, the, the study of uh, this SNP, we can do uh, a little specific expression analysis. 
uh, according to the frequency of, of the two alleles. And this analysis shows that indeed uh, one of, of the alleles is overexpressed over the other in a proportion of uh, three to one, which indicates uh, for the mm, possible presence of cis-acting mutations in regulatory regions of the gene, uh, causing the overexpression of the gene and the elliptical fridge phenotype. And now we are conducting additional experiments to confirm uh, this uh, result. But just to conclude, uh, in brief, we can tell that isoseq is uh, useful uh, for an accurate uh, detection of a large proportion of the transcriptome, including the identification of uh, novel genes and novel isoforms. And also that isoseq is useful uh, to detect allele and isoform specific expression uh, that, uh, that unveils uh, cis-acting uh, regulatory variation underlying diversity in grapevine agronomic traits. And just to finish, I would like to thank to all the people participating in this uh, work, to my colleagues in the laboratory of Tetlef Beigel in Tübingen, and also to collaborators in Spain in the laboratory of uh, Jose Miguel Martinez Zapater for the projects in Tempranillo and in Table Grapes, and also to uh, collaborators in Judius Kuhn Institute, to Daniel Senda and Eva Ciprian uh, for the project in Regent. And thank you, of course, for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions uh, here and also in this email address if there are further questions. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. <clears throat> so thank you all for joining the session this morning and the first presentation from Pablo on grapevine assembly and ISOSEQ that has been done. I would like to up apologize for the challenges with the video. Uh, we've reached out to the platform managers to make sure the issue is solved. Um, I'd just like to remind for the ones moving to the next session, please install Chrome. That seems to help. And it also seems that um, after internal investigation, now the last minutes, the video has been playing better. We hope <clears throat> the issues are going to get resolved um, moving forward. So with that, um, as promised, we'd like to open this session for questions. Uh, please type them in. And what I would like to do now here is um, yeah, leave Pablo some room to, to answer these questions. Um, please type them in and I will make sure that um, I will address these. Um, well, actually, I will speak out and then um, let Pablo answer these. So I'm going to the chat just now. And it seems there was a lot of um, comments on the video playing or rather not playing. So apologies for that again. I had one question though, Pablo, and that came in relation to the assembly. So what tool or bioinformatics analysis did you use to identify the allele and tissue specific expression? How many genes did you find to have haplotype or tissue specific expression? Okay, if you can answer that. Yeah, yeah, thank you very. So in this case, uh, we have not focused uh, at, at for differences at the whole uh, transcriptome level. And we just focus on specific genes that we were interested in. So I, I cannot tell at the whole transcriptome level for the, the level of differences. And then what we have done is uh, using uh, the ISOSIC3 analysis pipeline and analyzing each tissue individually to, to get uh, yeah, the number of genes that are expressed. And then, well, the, as, a, as a first approach, what we do is comparing uh, in IGB uh, the, yeah, the different level of expression on the genes that we are interested in. And then, also from the BAM uh, alignments of, of the reads uh, for the haplotype uh, or allele specific expression analysis. Uh, what we do is uh, calling SNPs and then uh, looking at the uh, difference of allele frequency to tell uh, for difference on allele level expression. But so far uh, we have only focused uh, at specific genes that we were interested in. But yeah, indeed the data is there to, to perform the analysis at the whole transcriptome level which is also an interesting question to, to answer with this data. Perfect. Thank you, Pablo. Um, I'm still watching the chat, uh, see if there's any further questions come in. Um, please don't hesitate to do that. I'm just going down. It's a little difficult to find the ones amongst all the comments. I have one more. Okay, so here's one more. So other than the context size, were there any other differences between SQL assemblies that you've done previously and SQL2 assemblies that you have done now? Um, and I guess this is a pretty open question, but yeah, in terms of uh, assembly quality or assembly performance? 
Yeah, yeah, there are several differences. For instance, uh, in terms of the consensus accuracy, uh, in the SQL two assemblies, uh, we reach uh, two orders of magnitude more accurate assemblies. And it is also difficult to tell if it's only the difference is only a matter of uh, of the the technology of using SQL two because also there's a genotype difference. And in, for instance, in this tree approach, um, uh, the the and in the one that we have sequenced uh, with a SQL two, there's more diversity between the parents, which which can also help to the assembly, but also like uh, having uh, more easily a uh, higher sequencing depth with SQL two. Uh, improves uh, the, the consensus accuracy, and we also detect uh, um, more uh, accurate assemblies in, ter in terms of uh, misassemblies that we have to correct from some of them from the uh, SQL 1 uh, sequencing assemblies. And I, ha I have also to say that uh, although uh, I have not presented this uh, today, uh, in the last weeks we have also run, uh, because these were uh, CLR assemblies, uh, we have also run high five for some uh, great uh, cultivars. And in this case, uh, yeah, the, what could this improve at a much higher level is the contiguity, because in this case, for this um, cultivar with high five, we didn't have uh, this uh, tree approach because there's no information from the parents. And even with, without this information, we reach uh, contig M50 values that are uh, about 17 megabases, which is much higher than the 12 that uh, we have with the CLR, also mm -hmm. even comparing with uh, SQL2. And in this case, from the 19 chromosomes of grapevine, uh, just from the CLR, from the initial assemblies, we have uh, like uh, five or six of them that are uh, uh, whole chromosome uh, assembled. So, so yeah, not only the, the SQL2, but also more recently, we see that using HiFi, uh, the, the assemblies are improved. So, so we are very happy with the progress of uh, this biotechnology. Perfect. So you see a difference, but it's actually rallying to the positive side on any front that you have. Yeah, indeed, yes. yes. We cannot hope for a better answer. Thank you, Pablo. I have a couple more questions that came in. Um, so let me just see. Uh, can you comment on the cluster size needed for your analysis? Uh, on, on the cluster, so, I mean, we, we have a, a big informatic cluster. And but yeah, that uh, indeed for the for the the assemblies uh, from uh, CLR, just, so you need a powerful cluster to deal with all this amount of data. But for instance, for this uh, last uh, uh, HiFi assembly that I was uh, commenting that we are uh, more recently running, uh, just uh, using our server, you don't need a cluster to to run the assembly because uh, yeah, the, the the assembly is more simplified. So. So yeah, if you have a powerful cluster, it helps, but uh, with the Hi-Fi, you don't need so many informatic resources. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, so I had one come in from uh, Simone. So um, did you get a haploid specific assembly in especially 2x480 megabase sequence? What tools did you use for the assembly? Canoe was default parameters. Any places where the assembly collapsed the two haplotypes? Um, if you could take that. Yeah, yeah. So in this case, uh, we use Canoo, but uh, we, we can't separate the, the, uh, the two haplotypes because we separate first the reads uh, with information from the parents. So, so yeah, at the end, uh, we, we have uh, the two separate assemblies and they, they are not collapsed. And the tool that we use uh, is also Canoo. And yeah, we. We also like change some parameters because then at the end, uh, it's the, as if we were assembling uh, homozygous inbred lines when we separate uh, the reads and by doing so, uh, there's uh, no collapsing of uh, haplotypes. Although uh, if, the, if the parents of, of the cultivar that we are assembling are not uh, distant enough, so sometimes uh, in the assembly you can tell that there are so a few haplotype uh, switches or, or duplicated haplotypes. And to, to check that, we have been using uh, well, several tools like uh, Busco or more recently, Mercury for camera analysis. Yeah, okay, perfect. I think we have one more minute. Um, I'll use the um, minute to say two things. So first, we have one more question. I think we can squeeze in, but um, to everyone out there, the video is recorded. It's gonna be available at the, and 
meeting, so you can have it. Don't worry about that part. Again, we apologize for any inconvenience. And as a final question um, for you, Pablo. So uh, you know, how does these products you have behave with polyploids? Um, do you think you could use it there too for polyploid plants? Well, um, I mean, theoretically, yes, because I, because I, but you would need to have information like from, uh, I don't know if parents or all the separate uh, haplotypes to look for specific gamers or, uh, of uh, all the, the, the haplotypes. But uh, I think that uh, if now that there's access to, to Hi-Fi, uh, if uh, with the accuracy of Hi-Fi reads, uh, uh, I think uh, it is possible to detect for genetic diversity between the different haplotypes so, so that even without using this, this approach, uh, uh, the, the accuracy of Hi-Fi reads uh, should be enough to separate the haplotypes in, in regular uh, assemblies. Thank you very much, Pablo. So once again, many thanks for attending this session. We'll move on to the next speaker, which is starting every second now. Thank you all for having joined. Uh, we hope for the best with the next video. Once again, thanks for sharing your great science, Pablo. Yeah, so thank you again also to Pagbay for the opportunity to 